So as soon as I made this turn, I witnessed the sheriff and the chief deputy go down. The shots are going off, bang, 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 bang. He moved to the right and slowed down only to have a shotgun barrel come out of a window and shoot him. She was unconscious. She was still holding on to her gun and her hand was on the trigger. I'm walking forward, trying to get out of the way of his bullets. My heart is racing, adrenaline is up. January 1st, 2011, just 12 hours into the new year, and a law enforcement officer lies shot dead near a trailer home in Ohio. Police are unable to reach the body of Deputy Suzanne Hopper. It was a Saturday, and the first shift of the year had started quietly for the local sheriff's office. Uh, honestly, it was a beautiful day here in Ohio. Um, I got up myself early that morning. Uh, I had run six and a half miles, felt great New Year's Day. I'd actually called her sergeant, um, Sergeant White, um, checked in with him. How did things go overnight? Uh, any, you know, wild and crazy parties, uh, any major arrests? And he said, no, it had been a great night. Uh, he was just finishing his paperwork, getting ready to hit the street. That New Year's morning, law enforcement officers were going about their more mundane duties, unaware of the danger they were about to encounter. Not but 30 minutes in, I was actually in the mall parking lot issuing, I was halfway through writing out a parking citation. Um, while I was writing that out, I heard the call go out. Shots fired at Enum Beach. Um, they sent Suzanne and Sergeant White out there to investigate. Uh, Clark County is a very rural county, a lot of farm country. Shots fired, just from listening to the radio traffic, shots fired is not an uncommon call to hear. Most of the time it is hunters. But this time, the call of shots fired will end with this patrolman injured and Deputy Hopper dead. I got on my phone and I, I saw the sergeant, Sergeant White, over by a tree. And uh, at that time we had Nextels, uh, you know, push to talk radios. And I asked him what was going on and he explained that there was a shot fired call that uh, he and, and Suzanne had responded and that the people in a trailer had reported that they heard someone yell and then a shot was fired and that they were investigating that complaint and that Suzanne was around and back and started to take photographs and uh, start getting information to write the report and he heard her yell Dusty and that's his name and then he heard a shot fired and then he went to his patrol car got his patrol carbine and came back around he could see she was down Suzanne was laying on the ground probably five feet from a trailer. There were no visible signs of life. Uh, she wasn't moving, her chest wasn't rising. Um, you don't want to tell yourself it, but I think everybody knew that 
there probably wasn't a whole lot we could do for her. From there, um, multiple units from the Clark County Sheriff's Office re responded. Uh, most of the uh, units that were in the initial perimeter uh, assumed positions with patrol carbines. Uh, Springfield police officers responded. Uh, German Township Officer Jeremy Blum responded. Um, Sergeant White had put out a call that he had an officer down. That Suzanne was shot. couldn't get to her. So we had units from really across the Miami, uh, the Miami Valley coming. I could see Michael Ferryman in the window and he stood there with a, a shotgun. Deputy Hopper was laying out there just outside of his door and I gave an order I told the detectives and any deputy out there, if they had a shot to take it, to stop this man, and so that we could recover Deputy Suzanne Hopper. Uh, from there, um, the detectives in the uh, trailer right straight across were armed with their patrol carbines and Michael Ferryman was then in the window and it appeared that he was holding up his shotgun and ready to take a shot. And that's when the exchange of gunfire took place. The exchange lasted for, it seemed like several minutes, but uh, somewhere around 80 rounds were fired. Um, I was standing at the front of the trailer. Deputy Chad Eubanks and uh, Officer Jeremy Blum were uh, right in front of me and uh, Michael Ferryman fired a shot and uh, shot Officer Jeremy Blum. It was very, very painful. Um, I got thrown. The I got hit in my arm, actually, my arm and on my on my sides right here. I have scars on my whole arm, my side, and a little bit on my back. And he rolled to the right, where he could have been shot and killed. And so myself and Major Garment went out and drug Jeremy back behind cover. Um, and uh, it was during this time that two more shots were fired. And it was later learned that one of um, my highly trained detectives uh, had been able to take two additional shots. And those were the two shots that actually stopped Michael Ferryman. With the gun battle over, Officer Blum was taken to the hospital, but Deputy Hopper was declared dead at the scene. Her family were forced to face a harsh truth they had tried to ignore. You already you realize that there's a danger. You're aware of that. And I think most people are aware that law enforcement officers uh, do face danger. I don't think we think about it. And you you can't you don't want to think about that too much, especially if you're a if you're a relative, a parent or a, a, a spouse or whatever it might be. <clears throat> But I don't think until this happened to Suzanne that I was aware as much how they face that every day. They never know when it's going to happen. The inherent dangers of policing make it not the ideal career choice for everyone. Officers do this every day as part of their job. They're wired a little differently than the rest of us. I think much like our, our soldiers, our, our military, uh, willing to take on risks that most of us would just assume avoid for our entire lives. Um, but they're asked to go out there every day and, and face potentially life-threatening situations. 
Uh, an officer never knows when that life-threatening moment may come, but they know that it could come on the very next call. The ease in which a law enforcement officer can lose their life was made clear by the tragedy that occurred in the city of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin on March 20th, 2011. It's early on a Sunday morning and a sexual assault suspect has shot a police officer. Patrolman Craig Burkholz races to the scene. The drivers of the cars he's passing would not have imagined that this officer himself would be dead within five minutes. The situation becomes worse as the suspect begins firing at police in the street. As Officer Burkholz nears the location, he parks at the end of the road, unaware the suspect is ex-military and armed with a rifle with a long-distance scope. Within moments, he is shot in the chest and killed instantly. Officer Burkholz left behind a wife, parents, and one brother. He was the third Fond du Lac officer to be killed in the line of duty. The officer the gunman shot initially had massive chest wounds and was lucky not to become the fourth. So this is, this is the house where the uh, suspect uh, in a sexual assault uh, occurred. And we uh, pulled up to the house parking tactically, uh, not in front of the residence. And uh, we, we ultimately ended up obtaining a key to the right side of the residence. At some point, I saw them go to the basement. There's windows down there. I could see they were clearing the basement. Um, I could see lights on the south side window that I could see. It was the only window on the south side of the building. Um, a few seconds later, um, I heard two shots and saw two orangish glows out of the window. We got to the staircase where, where I was shot, and ultimately, I just started taking off, and I went the, the way where, which I knew I could get out, and that was the same way I came. So we actually went through the basement instead of coming out this door, which probably would have been closer. Once Ryan got to the door, he fell against it, and I could see blood. And when he moved, blood started coming, and it got all over me. And Jason, Lieutenant Larridan, grabbed onto Ryan. Um, I heard them go down the stairs, and I heard Ryan fall um, behind me. And this was a matter of seconds. I heard Ryan say, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die. I'm dying. I heard Lieutenant Laird and Tom to get up, we got to move. Um, Ryan actually collapsed and fell down the steps um, with me kind of hanging on to his tack vest behind him and then fell uh, in the sidewalk terrace, uh, in the street terrace area. And at that time, um, I kind of told Ryan, I said, we, we need to go, we need to get you out of here. So I fell down a couple of times and Lieutenant Laird and kept on getting me back and encouraging me to uh, carry on down this sidewalk so we could get behind cover. And at this point, while we're, we're trying to get to cover, the shots are going off, bang, 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 bang. And at that point, we didn't know if the shots were directed at us or where they were going to. And uh, we were just trying to get to cover, and I couldn't really breathe, so I couldn't really move as fast as I'd like to have moved. And then we, we kind of came around till we got behind this house right here, which wasn't too far away. And because of my heavy breathing, they thought it was because of my tactical vest that was choking me was why I couldn't breathe. So we quick, I stripped, stripped off my tack vest and realized that wasn't why I was restricting my breathing, but I got, got down on a knee and I just tried to sat here and I tried to catch my breath as the shots were going off and I could distinctly smell like the gun smoke and, and, and everything in the air at this point. That's when Officer Craig Burkholz uh, arrived and I saw I did not know it was Craig at that time. I just saw him, a uh, figure, against a, a wall, and I heard um, two rapid shots being fired and this person fall, and I didn't know, again, who it was, but I could tell it was a police officer. And uh, we began yelling at that person to move and to get out of there to crawl, and uh, there, was, there was no response. Suddenly I look over to my left and I see an officer laying on the ground, he's laying on his stomach. And I didn't see the officer get shot, but I knew how he was laying, that, that he was dead. I, I knew for sure that he was dead, because he wasn't moving him, he was laying face down, and that officer ended up being uh, Craig Burkholz, uh, 
who I didn't even know was, uh, was on the scene at that time. So obviously in my condition, there was nothing I could do to help anyone. And at that point, I, all I could do was try to help myself. And we waited for what it didn't seem like a long time, but all of a sudden we, we observed an ambulance pull up right about in that location where that ambulance was. So Lieutenant Laird helped me to my feet and we kind of got side by side and we kind of did a slow jog to that ambulance. And at this point, once again, it just didn't seem like I had any lung capacity to, to really to go. So uh, Lieutenant Laird was encouraging me as we were running. He's like, come on, you gotta keep going, you gotta keep going. And I kind of say, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't. I gotta, and I uh, kept on doing as best as I could, but it was just so hard to get that, that much needed oxygen in my, in my blood. And we got about to this point right here, the ambulance that had just pulled up realized that there was gunfire going on all around us. And it knew it was too close to the scene. It was in a danger zone. So it started to back up down Division Street here. And when it started to back up, we were actually out on the road at this time. And we were running in the middle of the road at the ambulance and I was swearing my head off at the firefighters. I was saying, F you firefighters, F you firefighters, get back here firefighters. And we ran down that road. And eventually the ambulance stopped. And uh, when I got to the ambulance, all I said is I need some oxygen, I need some oxygen. I can't, I can't breathe, I need some oxygen. And so right away they got an oxygen mask on me and they started doing their work. And, and uh, th that's, when, uh, that's when I could finally kind of collect myself and get my bearings and try to assess the situation and what was going on. And, I definitely thought of my family first at that point. A member of Officer Williams' extended family, his police dog Rico, nicknamed Grendel, was shot too. The gunman fired into the squad car, hitting the dog. Yet, after months of recuperation, Rico has returned to his police duties. Three to get ready. Hang on. Four to call. At the end of each day, Ryan enjoys his time with his wife, two daughters, and Rico. He owes his life to the fact that on that day, in March 2011, he put on one of the department's newly acquired tactical bullet resistant vests. This is the ballistic tactical vest that I threw on um, right before we entered the residence. And uh, as uh, when I got shot, and it was a 308 rifle, the first shot actually went through a portion of my neck protector right here, and then went through several layers of bulletproof material, and I exited right here. And as you can see, K-9 Grundle is really interested in, in this. Uh, and then when it exited, Right here, uh, it was uh, it left a two-inch hole and went through several layers of bulletproof material, and it ended up going through my shoulder here and running around my back, and it was actually lodged in my back, and they had to cut it out of my back. Now, the second bullet uh, went in right here, and uh, that bullet uh, didn't go through as many layers of bulletproof material. Um, it only went through two layers right here. So it left a one inch hole, a smaller hole was going at a higher velocity. And these are the, the bullets that uh, they actually took from uh, inside me. These are, this is actually one bullet, but it's, it's fragmented because it, it mushroomed up to uh, such a point. And uh, it's, uh, it was very hard to identify because of how uh, mushroomed it, came, it became. But, The second bullet, the one that was in my back that uh, put a hole in my scapula, uh, is not as distorted. It was traveling at a higher rate of speed um, and did not hit as many layers of bulletproof material. So this is the rear of the second bullet. And if, the, if you would imagine this is a mushroom, the head of the mushroom would be the way the bullet is actually traveling here. So the bullet would be traveling this way. This is the back. And the reason why it mushrooms out like that is because it's going through several layers of bulletproof material and it causes the bullet to kind of bend in on itself, bend over on itself. And uh, so I kind of came up with a design for a tattoo, which I put right next to my back scar, um, which is a, a Fondelac K9 badge 
with the uh, saying, that which does not kill you only makes you stronger. And I, I have the uh, police memorial uh, symbol as well in the middle of the badge, um, kind of bringing Craig, Craig into it as well as a remembrance. Bullet resistant vests provide law enforcement officers a degree of protection against knife attacks and shootings. They've been doing so for nearly 50 years. In the 60s and 70s, uh, our police officers were being gunned down on a very regular basis. Uh, they were encountering violence uh, that was uh, unheard of uh, in the law enforcement industry in this country. Uh, we had record high numbers of officers killed. That drove people to start looking for solutions to the problems of protecting officers from ballistic threats and other threats. But at the same time, we had the evolution or the, the domestics arms race going on. We had the police officers uh, uh, trying to counter the change in weaponry from the old 32 uh, five shot to the 38, the 38 special that the, the uh, criminals of old used to the evolution into high powered 357 revolvers and then into auto loaders. That whole evolution was a, I got a bigger gun and then the other guy got a bigger gun. And today that threat has evolved from, from handguns to auto load, from pistols to auto loaders and now to shoulder weapons, and even handguns that are designed to penetrate body armor worn by, by police officers. Designed, the bullets are designed to do that. That's but their purpose. They're called cop killer bullets. There's a, a statistic that to me is, is just chilling uh, when you think about it. Here we are in 2012, and uh, the numbers seem to indicate that about 20% of the officers in America are not being provided with a bullet resistant vest by their own departments. I mean, that's sinful uh, and, and shameful uh, that our governments at the state, local level uh, cannot afford to give an officer a bullet-resistant vest, and yet we give them a gun and a badge and tell them to go out and keep us safe. And by the way, you're putting yourself at risk. We'll, we'll try to get you a vest eventually, but we can't afford it right now. I mean, what kind of statement is that to our protectors? A new threat facing officers today are extremist groups armed with assault rifles. In 2010, two West Memphis cops armed with pistols unknowingly stopped a father and son from an anti-government organization. The officers soon found themselves outgunned. Brandon died right here. Bill actually died in that ditch right there. A few miles away from the shooting, the West Memphis police chief was preparing for a few enjoyable days off. Instead, he was about to have the worst day of his life. Picked my wife up to go out of town. She had just had open heart surgery uh, two weeks prior to this. And we decided to go out of town for a, a respite and take a break. And while I was in my car, about 11.30 a.m. on May the 20th, a Thursday, I heard a call go out that the uh, officer was down, and uh, I didn't hear any prior radio traffic uh, up until that point, so I thought maybe the state police were involved in something. The dispatcher said it was at the Interstate 40. I was very close to that area, within a mile of it, and I told my wife, Linda, that uh, we need to pull over and see if we could offer some help. And then on the way over, I heard a call come back out with a dispatcher saying that there was two officers had been shot. We pulled up to the exit ramp and I had to go the wrong way up the ramp. And the first thing I noticed was there were no state trooper cars there, only the West Memphis police. And as I got out of my car, I told my wife to stay in the car. I noticed other cars pulling up from West Memphis uh, from the opposite direction that I had pulled into and the officers were getting out and running down the slope of the incline from the exit ramp toward a small ditch that had water in it. I saw, focused my attention to that ditch and I saw an officer lying face down in that uh, ditch in shallow water. And the officers went down and picked him up and said, Bill, you're gonna be okay. And then I knew it was Bill Evans. So I went down to see Bill and it was obvious he had been shot several times. And then I recall that the dispatcher had said there were two officers down. 
So I focused my attention back up the ramp to where the police cars were parked and I saw a sergeant standing there. So I take, make my way up the hill and Sergeant Milton Weaver said, Chief, please don't go up there. Well, I knew then it was probably gonna be Brandon. And as I rounded the, uh, the front of a marked police car, I rounded the driver's side, I saw that Brandon lying on his back um, had been shot several times and he was facing up. And I walked up to him and I stood over him, looking down at him. And my entire life just drained out of my body at that point. I was just, it was the worst day of my life. I was looking down at my son that had just been shot. And I was standing there trying to decide what I needed to do and what I needed to do as a police chief and what I needed to do as a father. And I'm standing there frozen, looking at Brandon. And then I realized that Linda is back in the car. So I turn and focus my attention back to her as she has, is out of the car and is running toward my direction, toward Brandon. And I knew that just going through open heart surgery, there's no way she could see her son in that condition. So I motioned for the officers to take her and she collapsed. I thought she had just died. So I run to where she is and we put her back in the car. And then she asked if it was Brandon. I said, yes, it is. And she says, is he okay? I said, no, he's not okay. And she says, how do you know he's not? I said, Linda, I just know Brandon is not okay. Is he dead? I said, yes, he is. And of course she, you know, as any mother would react. She screams and then she's, she just can't believe she's lost her son. Police immediately sealed off major escape routes and began searching for the killers. Every law enforcement officer in the area wanted to help. One of those who responded was wildlife officer Mike Neal. I called a friend of mine, he's on CID with state police. Uh, his name's Philip Hydra, and I was just going to call him, kind of talk to him a little bit. And as soon as, he, as, soon as I called him, uh, I knew something was wrong. And the sirens were going, and he don't run a whole lot of sirens. So uh, as soon as he answered the phone, I said, what do you got going on? And he said, man, we got a bad deal. We got two officers down in West Memphis and shot with AK-47s. He said, we're on our way over there. And me being state law enforcement, we can go anywhere in the state that we need to go, and that's in my district and my patrol area. So I told him I'd be on my way. And I hung up the phone with him. I called my sergeant, uh, told him what was going on. I knew what was happening. He said, get up here as quick as he could because he was in this area. So, uh, you know, I, I did something different and I was fortunate enough at that point that I had time to prepare myself. I was able to pull off on the side of the road. I put my heavier body armor on and I slung my M4 rifle and hung it on my chest. And I got back in the truck and started that way. I come down and made the turn. And right here where I made this turn, it's where the gunfire started. As soon as I made this turn here, it's when all the gunfire began and I could, I mean, you could hear that, that AK-47 has a very distinct sound, especially in the shopping center parking lot. So as soon as I made this turn, I witnessed the sheriff and the chief deputy go down. And at that point in my mind, they were, they were killed, they were dead. I have the rifle right here in my lap. Uh, when I started into the parking lot and the gunfire started, I immediately transitioned the rifle up into the windshield and started towards them. The bullets started coming through the windshield. They shot this pillar out completely. Some of the rounds were coming over my head. My headrest had a bullet hole in it. 
I had laid across the console and was returning fire pretty much from the passenger seat. And in the picture, you can see the, the bullet holes stair-stepping coming across to the point he found where I was inside the truck. And that's where he concentrated his fire at that point. And I was doing the same thing to him. Luckily, I was able to get to him before he got to me. Officer Neal's actions prevented the suspects from finishing off the county officers that had stopped them from driving out of the parking lot. There's not a doubt in my mind that he saved the sheriff and, and the uh, uh, chief deputy's life that day. I spoke with him on numerous occasions and been to the hospital and, and visited the chief deputy on one occasion. And, you know, when, when they start talking about the incident, it's hard for both of them not to cry because they know that Michael was their savior on that day. You know, I think that day will stick with me for the rest of my life. Uh, I don't think you'll ever, uh, you know, and I, I say it's, it's kind of like being a prisoner of that day. It's always going to be with me for the rest of my life. Uh, I tell other officers, you know, in training, I say, you know, it's not a matter of if it's going to happen to you, it's when it's going to happen to you. And if you're not thinking that way, you might want to start. If you don't want to start, you might want to reevaluate your job. Because look at me, I'm a game warden. Look what I got in. You know, it's not if it's going to happen, it's when. This is my second time. And my thought pattern right now is, when's it going to happen again? You know, I don't think right now, well, I've been into something, it, it ain't going to happen again. It's going to. I fully expect it. I prepare for it on a daily basis. I train for it. Across America, hundreds of officers die every year. The loss of each is felt deeply by their families, friends, colleagues, and the community they served. On January 24, 2011, Miami had one of its largest police funerals after two officers were gunned down. Thousands of people turned out to pay their respects, and the funeral was carried live on local television stations. The families of the slain officers were at the center of a citywide day of mourning. The shootings had occurred just days earlier as detectives tried to arrest a fugitive wanted for murder. Two other officers on the scene survived, but they are haunted by traumatic memories. Our guns are drawn, we're going in, and knowing that the, ho the, the, act, the movement that was going on on the, the one window side of the house, we focused on that, that, that was gonna be our focus when we got inside the house. All right, this is her second visit to the window. She's still not come to the front door. We're going inside. Roger comes in, he comes between Amanda and I, and Amanda's already at her approach at the door at the, and she says, let me see your hands, let me see your hands, but that's a normal, that would be, that's normal for Amanda to be saying something to, and um, especially let me see your hands. That was, that was an out of the norm. And shortly thereafter, it, it was like gunfire. In my mind, I'm thinking, man, you know, she had to, you know, she had to do what she had to do, and then at the same time, I'm registering that Amanda spins around, and then she collapsed to the ground, and then it was just When she spins to the ground, I'm just trying to register everything that's going on. And then there was just an impact of force coming at me and I had to shield myself to what was coming and I was knocked to the ground and, and then more gunshots were continuing. They're outside. 
for some reason I was able to get up. I go outside and Oscar is standing over the subject. And when I see Roger, I see he has a gunshot wound and he looks so peaceful. I know there was, he had already passed and I knew, of all people, if Amanda was able to get out there and help, she would have. And when I saw her, it was she was unconscious. She was still holding on to her gun, and her hand was on the trigger. took her gun, I put it in the front pocket of my vest. I held her hand. She was breathing rapid. prayed with her, told her everything was going to be all right. I knew being there with her condition she was in, I was never going to see her alive again. Gunfire broke out. Uh, later I found out that uh, the subject came out of a back room running and firing uh, towards them. Um, Roger and Amanda were killed. Uh, Didi was injured. Uh, the subject made it outside where he ran into me and he and I engaged in a, in a gun battle and uh, I killed the subject. The loss of life is, is never an easy thing particularly when it, when it comes to people that are parents that have small children growing up and they're going to have to spend the rest of their lives without, without their father or without their mother. It's just, it's, it's just tragic. Detective Haworth left behind two teenage boys named Austin and Jordan. Austin's room is filled with photos and memorabilia of his mother. She was funny. She was like a fun person. She would always do these like little dances around the house and always make jokes and mess with me and mess with, you know, our animals and her friends and stuff. So she was just, she was just a fun person to be around. This is one of my favorite uh, awards, you could say, that my mom got. I like it because it's uh, given her by the Marshals, which uh, they're a pretty big deal. And she was really proud to be a Marshal. This also is, this one's probably my favorite one. Just I like the, the picture and how it is. So this is, this one's my favorite one. I think it's the nicest one. There's this. 
which I think this is very, very nice. It has, you know, a badge, her picture, uh, medals, pins, everything. And this is actually a, a Medal of Valor, which is a pretty big deal. And we got this from the Fraternal Order of Police. And this is absolutely one of one of my favorite things that we've gotten. That's a nice one. It has a picture of the funeral. Everyone kept saying to uh, that to be strong and that she's always with you, but pretty much everyone was saying, you know, sorry for your loss and that it'll all get better and that uh, I should always be with you, but it didn't it didn't really help at all. Um, at that time, I was, I was really sad, and, uh, you know, I was kind of angry, kind of that she went in first, in a way, it, cause she always, she always wanted to be the, the hero, you know, and she was the hero, but she, you know, it cost her her life, which, which really sucks, so I was kind of mad about that, but. Then I, I thought about it and I understand that, you know, that's how she was, that's who she was, so, I mean, yeah, I was mostly sad. I want, I want to be pretty much exactly what she was, a detective and work with uh, career criminals. Um, I've wanted to do that pretty much all my life, but now especially more with what's happened and everything that's been going on, I want to do it even more now than I did before. Just, you know, kind of so I could be like her, but also so I could, you know, take down the bad guys, I guess. Yeah. Killed alongside Detective Haworth was Detective Roger Castillo. He left behind a wife and three sons. They too have received a collection of awards and medals. This is one of the plaques that we received. Um, it's like a sketch of his photo, and it's from the Police Benevolent Association. It says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. Yeah, somebody, um, one of the writers from the Herald, or artists from the Herald, drew this for us. It's really pretty. It's a badge of courage. I do have a strong support system in my family and I was at a very good place in my marriage when this all happened. So although at the moment you think, why, why would this happen when everything's so good? Now I can look back and say, thank God, everything was so good. It's been a year and, um, and four months. And I just want to be able to um, to heal a little bit. Because he's always, he's always uh, present in our lives. We talk about him every day. But I just want to remember the, the, our memories. I don't want to keep remembering that day. That horrible day. Every officer killed leaves dozens of broken lives behind. One of the most outspoken voices concerned with the well-being of law enforcement officers is John Rivera president of the Dade County Police Benevolent Association. It's my personal opinion that uh, there's no greater heroes in this world than the angels, the guardians that patrol the streets of, of uh, our cities. These men and women say goodbye to their families, never ever knowing, never ever knowing where they're gonna come back. And you know, as a police officer, you tell your family, uh, if you get a knock on the door and you see uniform, it's because it's bad. We all prepare our loved ones for that. 
And so every day you're out on the street, your loved ones are wondering whether they're going to get that knock on the door. That's a hell of a way to live an entire career. And then every funeral you go to, it's just, it's, it's heart-wrenching to see the wives and the widows and the children. And, but as long as we have incompetent, uh, uncaring politicians, they'll forget about Roger. Uh, three boys, or Amanda's two boys, they'll forget that real quick. Those boys will be fatherless, and uh, they will live with that wound and that scar for the rest of their lives, while at the same time these politicians eat caviar and look for the next person who's going to make some donations to their campaigns so they can ride in some convertible down the streets and parades and stuff. Uh, that needs to stop. That needs to stop. One of the most disturbing shootings of a police officer in 2011 occurred in San Diego on August 7th. It was a Sunday afternoon and Officer Jeremy Henwood had just bought a hamburger at the start of his shift. Minutes later, he was shot dead as the fast food bag laid unopened in his back seat. Also on patrol that fateful afternoon, was Sergeant Mike Holden. Uh, they just had an all-points bulletin put out, uh, all units here within the division, about a car that was last seen southbound 15 at University. Uh, that car was an Altima, black Altima, or some type of a Nissan. The driver suspected having a shotgun that had just shot someone in a neighboring city. I pulled up, uh, this is Marlboro Avenue here, uh, to get up on the University to look for the car when uh, Naomi, who was a civilian, first civilian on, on Jeremy's uh, scene, put out that an officer had been shot at 45, 45th Street at University Avenue. When the sergeant arrived, he faced his worst nightmare. I just remember that I wanted to be there for him. And I knew that um, seeing his wound and, and doing th this job for the time that I've done it, for as long as I've done it, that it was a, a devastating, uh, very possibly a mortal wound. And I wanted to know that, uh, that I was there with him. The other officer in the car wanted uh, Jeremy to know that, that we were there with him. Jeremy Henwood's brutal killing shook the entire police force. Jeremy's death, I believe, struck every officer within our division, our department, and, and probably throughout the country of people who know the circumstances um, in, a, in a large manner because we all know that could have been any one of us. Jeremy was assassinated as he, he yielded to the right. A car behind him began flashing its lights, according to witnesses. And I believe he was moving to the right to see if he could assist somebody. And you know, nine times out of 10, somebody wants directions or they want to report a crime. And he moved to the right and slowed down and only to have a shotgun barrel come out of a window and, and shoot him. And uh, every one of us felt that, that vulnerability because that could have been, and it still could be any one of us. And he was shot not because he was Jeremy Henwood, he was shot because he was a police officer in a marked police car. And, he was probably the first police officer the suspect saw. Um, he had a lot of ammunition when, yeah, after he shot Jeremy, he went to his apartment, which was nearby, and told a neighbor that, hey, you better go inside, I just shot a cop and it's gonna get ugly around here. And moments later, came back outside with more ammunition and was getting back in his car, and that's when he was confronted by our officers. Uh, he exited the car with a shotgun and he was shot by our officers and killed at the scene. My personal opinion is he was coming back to the scene with more ammunition and, and uh, probably many lives were saved by the brave actions of those officers in taking him into custody. The story of Officer Henwood gained worldwide attention when it was discovered that moments before his death, he generously bought some food for a boy at McDonald's. When I first walked into McDonald's, about Jeremy Henwood. I saw him, he was a very tall officer. He looked like, other officers I think look like me, like like mean, mean, 
but I looked at him, he looked pretty nice. So I was like walking around a little, I was like, how can I approach, how can I like make him think I'm a good kid? And I seen him, I approached him and uh, I was buying my stuff and he bought my stuff. In my mind I'm thinking like, wow, this is a nice guy. He bought me some cookies and everything. Cops are not so bad. And I said, I want to make it to the NBA. And he said, you got to work hard for that. And I said, and I, then I told him, yeah, I know. And then he's like, I hope you make it. I wanted to meet him more, like see him more and everything, because he's a nice officer. And I was the last one to talk to him until he got shot in the head. So I'm thinking like, wow, man, like some guy, some post officer I just met just lost his life. Seconds after he didn't talk to me, did a good act of kindness to me, gave me cookies that he had to shoot a police officer in the head. For what reason? The police officer didn't do nothing to you. He probably had a bad perspective about the police officer like I did before, where he was already to his age where he was like, I left a suicide note where I want to die, so I might as well take people with me wherever I'm going. Good people, where he might be going somewhere to a bad place while Jeremy Hillwood is in heaven with God in a better place. No one knows better the type of man Jeremy Henwood was than his fellow officers on the Mid-City Squad. Well, Jeremy's, uh, his work ethic was uh, the same as his attitude leaving the end of the day. He was always excited to be here at work. And uh, at the end of the day, he would still be excited. And, you know, he wanted everybody to go out and still continue having fun. And Jeremy, we'll be back again tomorrow. And it didn't matter. He still wanted to keep going. So like he didn't want to leave from it. He, he just wanted to, he wanted to, he wanted to continue and it just it had to stop, Jeremy, we gotta go home. <laughs> he had the exact same expression on his face at two o'clock when the work when the shift started. Yep. And at twelve thirty when we were changing everything home. It just the energy just never changes. Always had the same mentality. Always smiling, you know, always laughing. You know, some guys can walk in the coat walk in at the end of the shift and they look like they're just really beat up, but not him. He walked in, still the same smile, you know. It's just what's special about that McDonald's video. And when you, you know, when you think of the person that's out there protecting you and keeping you safe at night, um, that's that's what you want. You want that police officer that still cares about the people in the community, and that's the type of police officer it was. So we could use two thousand more of, of Jeremy. Officer Henwood's family was at their home in Texas when they were informed that he was shot. They are still struggling to come to terms with Jeremy's death. You know, on the one hand, you're kind of grieving. On the other hand, you're kind of really proud of your son did so many things. We're glad he did as many things as he did. Um, the impact is hard, and I'm sure the impact on others is harder. Um, it's just hard on us. I can't imagine how hard it is on some of the others. Um, everybody doesn't die a hero. Everybody doesn't die on the job, not making a mistake. Everybody doesn't have that opportunity. And everybody doesn't have a police department that can afford to throw themselves entirely behind honoring him. And, uh, but this stage, it's still tough. A lot of good memories, but a a lot of missing. The tragedy on that hot August afternoon in 2011 has given Officer Henwood's family an unwanted insight into the dangers of working in law enforcement. The general public should um, have more respect and appreciation for what law enforcement officers uh, of all kinds do for us. And number one is putting their life on the line. Uh, and even being the mother of a policeman, I didn't really realize that that's what was at stake, you know, on a daily basis. And uh, I guess we, uh, you get lulled into a feeling of um, 
uh, security and, and taking things for granted um, when nothing much happens. Um, and I refer to Jeremy especially because he had three tours of duty as a Marine over the past um, 10 years and uh, nothing ever happened to him, which, and then to come home and be assassinated while you're sitting at a red light seems um, strange and cruel to me. But working on it, there must be a reason for that. I didn't consider it law enforcement dangerous because I had a, I just didn't. I didn't think, it, it, it never crossed my mind. I guess I was never made aware until Jeremy, until Jeremy's incident that there's a lot of police officers that lose their lives in the line of duty. I had no idea that it was a number so horrifically large. I mean, all you hear about really in the media and on the news is how many soldiers are dying in the war. So there is this perception that being a soldier is the most dangerous kind of job you can have. And we all grasp that because Jeremy was a soldier. He was a Marine and for many years in combat zones and he kept us from a lot of that. I mean, we're hearing stories now about uh, some of the dangerous things that he was doing over there and some of the situations he was in that it's a real miracle he made it out of. But um, you don't hear about a lot of stories about police officers that are in dangerous situations every day. In 1991, a memorial was built near the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. to increase public awareness of the law enforcement officers who have made the ultimate sacrifice. The memorial features two 300-foot curving marble walls carved with the names of more than 19,000 officers who have been killed in the line of duty. Every year, the families of fallen officers are invited to attend the annual memorial service at the monument. And this year is no different. Flying in from Miami are the families of Roger Castillo and Amanda Haworth. They are met by police honor guards from around the world. As a sign of respect, the families are helped through the airport and receive a full police escort to their hotels At the same time, 1,500 law enforcement officers are on the final stretch of several 300-mile bike rides to the memorial. Each officer rides in the memory of a fallen colleague. This is uh, for Kenneth Van. He's a deputy who was killed by gunfire at Bear County Sheriff's Department. Robert Atkins and Wayne Olson from the Town of Summit Police Department. They were killed in the line of duty back in January 26, 1975, shot and killed outside of the police department. Officer Ryan Williams has come from Wisconsin. They're all Craig. They're all for Craig. They're basically a way uh, that would, we can kind of thank the people waiting for us. I've actually got two of them that are going to go towards uh, to the actual to help me out of the house, and one to uh, Lieutenant Lairdon, who uh, got me to the ambulance. And then one's going to go to my wife, who went through all this with me. So, and the other one I'm going to keep. So, kind of a neat little uh, symbolism. Uh, almost all, all the riders have them, and they're going to give them to certain people. Um, and, and we wear them through the whole ride. So, it's kind of a neat little gesture.
Mike Califano and Jeff Reichoff from Nassau County, New York. They were killed in 2011 and their names are uh, thrown on the wall. This year, these riders have raised $1.65 million for the memorial. But the event has become more than a fundraiser. It brings together cops from all over the country. It also connects their families, giving everyone a sense of being part of the greater law enforcement community. During the 15 years of the Police Unity Tour, over $11 million has been raised. It shows the commitment to the memorial, but it also reveals the strong belief amongst officers that their fallen should never be forgotten. The tour helps to spread an awareness of fallen officers to the public but has taken on even more significance amongst those who participate. I said earlier today in a speech that it's, it's about uh, heroics, heroism. It's about accountability and respect and responsibility. When I come here, I realize that it's our, our responsibility that we make sure that those memories of those 19,000 plus officers, both men and women, uh, are never forgotten. That their stories are important and I hope that all the families out there that have lost a loved one realize that they have our continued family and that we are the brothers, the sisters, the fathers, the wives, and the husbands that they need and the people that they can lean on and care about and support. And that's why it's so important to mention concerns of police survivors, the Garden State survivors, uh, survivors of the Triangle, all the support groups around the United States that assist these families in such a way that no one else can because they've lived it. They've lived the sacrifice. They lived it the lifestyle of a law enforcement wife or husband or a son or a father or a daughter or whatever relative they may be and they are able to understand that that comes with a certain commitment and sacrifice so if you were to ask me why law enforcement officers families are close why law enforcement in general are close I would say it's a thin blue line it's the line that our family serves with us and we serve with them and that all the families who lose or loss or have issues, we continue to make sure that they have somebody in that thin blue line that cares about them. The nation's capital is full of monuments that honor presidents and fallen soldiers. But every year, the National Law Enforcement Memorial celebrates the lives of fallen officers. Surviving spouses, children, friends, and colleagues leave cards and photos to remind people of their lives. Police officers come from all over the country to pay their respects, many coming every year. Officers from Ohio have brought flowers in memory of Deputy Suzanne Hopper. The two boys and the family of Amanda Haworth pay their respects by her name on the wall. It's an emotional moment for Roger Castillo's wife, Debbie, and her three sons.
Jeremy Henwood's parents have come from Texas and found his name on the wall. I feel very proud, but at the end of the day, I think I would have to say, um, I'd rather have Jeremy here, period. Um, I'm so sorry. It's, um, it's a lot of effort by a lot of people, and um, we will be eternally grateful, and it will help us to remember um, how well he's thought of and what he accomplished. But I would still rather just have him here. Last night we had a little, um, uh, you know, congregation of family members and the police and we were having a few beers and joking around and I said, you know, Jeremy would love this. He would really like this. This would be right up his alley. But needless to say, <laughs> it wouldn't be happening if Jeremy was here. So kneeling by Craig Burkholt's name is Officer Ryan Williams, who's come to pay his respects. But Police Week is also an opportunity to celebrate the bravery of officers. And Officer Williams is receiving his award for being Officer of the Month in December 2011. Our Officer of the Month for December 2011 is Officer Ryan Williams, of the city of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin Police Department. Another officer, Anton Sampson, is receiving the August Officer of the Month Award. He works for the Department of Homeland Security Federal Protective Service. But his heroic story didn't occur at work. It happened when he was off duty, at home. On April 11th, 2011, I was uh, talking to a contractor here at my front door, and we were just talking about work. And uh, I stepped out here to talk to him some more, and the neighbor's daughter ran up. And her eyes were big like a cartoon. She, I knew she was uh, terrified about something. Um, I brought her up, and she said, there's a guy with a gun, and he has my friend. I tell the contractor, call 911 and tell him what's going on. So while he's making that call, we're still approaching the house. I don't see anything. I'm not hearing anything. My heart's racing. At this point, I don't know what to expect coming around this corner. So I'm trying to be as, tact as tactful as I can, tactically sound as I can coming around the corner. So I edge out a piece of the, the deck here and at the time, the door had stopped moving. So I'm picking up little pieces of the deck, stepping forward, stepping forward. And just as I can make out the figure on the deck, he fires two shots. So I fire two shots. 
and he backs up and I back up. He's out here this way, but it, once I pick him up, as soon as I see him, he's running and he's firing back like this at me. As he's firing at me, I'm walking forward, trying to get out of the way of his bullets. My heart is racing, adrenaline is up. I come down here and we're still exchanging shots with momentary pauses in between. Once he gets out about 50 or 60 yards, I, the threat's going away, so I stop firing at him and I need to go back and in my mind, I'm thinking I need to go back to the house and check on the little girl that's in the house. The shooter, he tried to hide in the woods and change his appearance and uh, the police were able to catch him later. If something had happened to her, I can't even think how I would respond or how I would feel because when something means that much to you, you, you think of everything but losing or hurting that thing. You know, my daughter, I mean, I love my daughter tremendously. It, it, it impressed me so much um, that he just put everything on hold for her. Um, he has children, he has a daughter, he has a beautiful daughter, he has a wonderful son, he has a beautiful wife, you know, and he was concerned with protecting her at the peril, possibly, of his own life. He's a special guy to me, he's, he's, he's super, he, that's what I'll call a superhero, if there's such thing, you know, in an adult sense of the word. When you're a cop, you don't turn it off when you get off off the clock. Um, almost every day when we're on the way home, we stop at a traffic accident. We stop to get first aid, do traffic control. We're not on the clock. We're getting, not, not getting paid to do that. It's, it's, this is a calling, and you either want to do it or you don't. We, you, you know, no, nobody gets rich being a cop. You, it, same as with the military. You're a public servant. You do it because you feel a calling. And it doesn't matter if you're off duty, on duty, if there's somebody in need, you do it. That's what being a cop is about. Reflecting back on that day, uh, I was going in the house to, you know, wind down from a day of work as I normally do, and then um, having that casual conversation with that contractor, and then bam, that little girl runs up with that terrified look on her face, telling me what's happened, just, uh, solidified for me that just because I leave work per se and go home, I'm still a police officer, even off duty. And I can be called to respond to something or act on something on behalf of others that can't defend themselves in uh, certain situations. Um, I was very glad that I was able to respond for the sake of the little girls and everybody involved. Um, but yeah, it's just a constant reminder that just because you take off a uniform and hang it in a closet and put your gears, you know, your duty gear away, you're not always done. The focal point of Police Week is the candlelight vigil at the Memorial Wall. All the families are escorted to the event and police honor guards from across the country provide a corridor for them to enter.
The evening of remembrance begins with an address from the Memorial Fund's chairman, Craig Floyd. Our cherished freedoms and liberties would not exist without the sweat and blood of some 800,000 professionals whose simple motto is to serve and protect. And with such valiant service comes sacrifice. Since 1791, more than 19,000 federal, state, and local officers have sacrificed their lives. Behind every name on these walls are stories and memories that burn brightly tonight and every night. Stories that inspire us and memories that cannot be extinguished. We will always remember these extraordinary American heroes. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Tonight, with candles aglow, we join together in memory of many, in honor of all. They are our peacemakers, those who put the welfare of others above their own. America's thin blue line protecting the lawful from the lawless. This monument that embraces us pays tribute to their heroic spirit. It is also a symbol of the thanks that too often goes unspoken. To all of the officers gathered here tonight, please know that your nation has been deeply touched by your service and your sacrifice. Each new name inscribed on these walls reminds us of the strength of your resolve. But those names also remind us of the terrible price of freedom and public safety. That is why we especially honor tonight those survivors of the fallen and the sacrifices they too have made on behalf of the innocent. Please know that your loss is shared by us all. We pray on your behalf for hope and healing. As we shine our candles skyward in silent tribute, let us solemnly pledge to always remember and honor our righteous protectors, those who have fallen, those who have been left behind, and those who continue to serve. Like the warmth of our candles and the memories in our hearts, Tonight and always, the thin blue line shines clear and bright. Thank you for protecting us, for giving us hope, and for never failing to raise us up in times of trouble. You know, the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial is the only memorial that will never be finished. All of the other memorials in our nation's capital have all the names inscribed. Uh, and the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial is going to be adding names, um, unfortunately, uh, forever. We want to celebrate who these people are, all law enforcement officers. They, they died doing something they loved. They died protecting someone that they don't know. Someone that may even hate police officers, but yet when they need help, police officers are the ones that showed up. People need to remember that this is, this is a life or death job. You know, these are the same as, as your troops abroad. And uh, you know, honor your police officers the same as you would honor your troops. If I could change one mentality among the folks we serve in this country and in this world, it would be this. If they get stopped for a traffic infraction and that officer who walks up to their car seems unnaturally tense, cautious, it's not personal, it's our business, and it's our business to be that way because it's ingrained in us. If we hadn't lost so many lives under similar circumstances, we wouldn't be that way. But I submit to you that it takes a very special person to stand at the head of a dark alleyway knowing that there is danger in that alleyway somewhere and actually go and do it. It's phenomenal. It's, it's, of course it's courageous. Of course it's dedication. And of course they think about everything that they could lose. Every day, thousands of law enforcement officers across America leave their homes not knowing if they will return. One of them will be killed in the line of duty every 54 hours.